All right, hello everyone. Welcome to Kalana's webinar on navigating LLM evaluation and hallucination detection. My name is Skip Everling. I'm heading up developer relations here at Kalina. Very excited to have you with us here today as we review this hot topic in machine learning. I'm sure you'll get a lot out of it. Um, our goal today is really to shed light on a, this critical aspect of LLM development and deployment, hallucinations, and how to address their challenges. As many of you are already familiar, I'm sure, large language models like GPT-4, Mixtro, Llama, et cetera, are these intensively trained mega models that learn statistical relationships and text in order to process and generate natural language. They're built on vast amounts of data, can have potentially trillions of parameters, and that complexity allows them to be versatile for almost any NLP task. We're seeing LLMs extend well beyond the tech industry into linguistics, psychology, law, healthcare, essentially any domain that involves language. And as LLMs become more capable and start to permeate more domains, we're really compelled to address uh, concerns about privacy, bias, and misinformation in particular. So in our webinar today, we're going to focus especially on that topic of misinformation for large language models, that is hallucinations and methods of performing hallucination detection. Uh, while Mark, our speaker, is getting set up, I just want to say a quick word about Kalena uh, and our research team. So Kalena really believes that quality in AI really comes down to robust testing of machine learning products. We help companies ship high quality models faster with a complete end-to-end -end ML testing and debugging platform. And we have an in-house research team that develops novel model explainability features, such as identifying gaps in a model's test coverage and automatically surfacing failure scenarios. The team researches and recommends new quality standards uh, to gain visibility into model behaviors through metrics. Uh, and the larger mission is really to redefine the state of the art for ML testing for the benefit of all of us. Uh, so we've got Kalina researcher Mark Chen joining us today. He's going to talk about his work on LLM hallucinations. Mark is a machine learning engineer on the team. He studied at the University of Waterloo, uh, one of the foremost academic institutions for AI research in particular. He's been spending the past year uh, investigating hallucination detection frameworks, and I'm thrilled he was able to make the time to join us here to discuss his findings. Welcome, Mark. Hey, everyone. And once again, welcome to Kalena's webinar on hallucination detection and LLMs. Uh, my name is Mark. And as Skip mentioned, I'm one of the researchers here at Kalena. I'm super excited to be here today uh, to talk to you all about LLMs and their hallucinations. Uh, ever since the blow up of LLM hype just over a year ago, many new updates and papers have been rolling out continuously without any signs of slowing down. And one of my major interests through this learning journey was figuring out a generic way to detect hallucinations that was suitable for multiple LLM use cases. And I'll be sharing that with everyone today. Um, my major learnings are always published on Towards Data Science. So please, if you're interested, uh, you can find those articles on my LinkedIn. All right, Skip, uh, that's enough about me. Why don't we get started? Sounds good. Thank you, Mark. Looking forward to hearing your insights here. Uh, for those of you in the live audience, please feel free to use the Q&A feature in your Zoom interface to ask questions. You can ask questions throughout the talk. Uh, we'll try and address some of those uh, at the end uh, or before that. We have a couple of people to respond uh, to the chat in the meantime. So feel free to ask questions throughout. So Mark, maybe you could start us off uh, by explaining what LLM hallucinations are. Yeah, um, before I explain what an LLM hallucination is, let's backtrack a little and review what an LLM is and what hallucination means. Uh, so those terms by themselves. Uh, I like to think of a large language model as a human council within the world's biggest library. And this council of people is full of diversity. There are people of every age group from different decades, uh, every country, every language, every occupation. And I can ask this council any question or give them any instruction. Uh, for example, if I said, summarize the story of Adam and Eve in the tone of a five-year-old, then everyone would go to their sections of the library, 
look around and come back to huddle and discuss. Uh, then the religious group might say, here's the most relevant information. The math and science department might say they've got nothing. And finally, the five-year-old would take all this presented information and outline the story in their own words for me. As another example, if I asked who voices Barbie in the Barbie movie, then there might be an uproar in the council. Uh, perhaps nobody in this council lived in 2023 because of the training cutoff. And then there would be a lot of confusion because there are actually multiple movies for Barbie. Uh, finally, this council decides on either saying we don't know or some random name, which is arguably a hallucination. Uh, speaking of which, a hallucination from a medical point of view is a flawed perception of reality. So if I were to randomly hear voices of people in my room or begin to see flying penguins, I'm probably hallucinating. Um, but going back to the original question, an LLM hallucination is simply a model's flawed perception of truth. So it is any undesirable text generation that deviates from what is correct. And this can, this can be a black and white disagreement based on absolute truth or even subtle differences or any additional information beyond what appears to be factual. Right. Yeah. So if I'm understanding that correctly, hallucinations can be understood as a model's incorrect or misleading outputs, um, anything deviating from the truth. Uh, and these deviations could range from a subtle difference to an outright contradiction. So that there are degrees of severity in hallucinations. Does that sound correct? Yeah, yeah. Got it. Are there multiple types of hallucinations? Yes, there are definitely multiple types. Um, I just stated three, uh, but there are many more. Uh, some more specific ones might be like a statistical hallucination or a historical hallucination. The list goes on and on. The truth is hallucination types are not very well defined globally. It's somewhat customizable and subjective based on what you care about. Uh, for lack of a better word, it's fluid. Uh, but there are certain types of hallucination that most people would agree on, such as blatant contradictions. Uh, so why don't I show everyone some examples? Uh, so I'll be using Kalena's platform to show off some concrete examples since it makes it easy to view data samples and results together. Uh, so here on our homepage, we have a bunch of data sets ranging from audio, uh, CV, tabular, and more. Uh, we're going to go to Truthful QA, which is a question answering data set. And here we can see a preview of what this data set looks like. Uh, let's go to the studio, our data visualization tool. And I'm going to add the GPT 3.5 turbo results, as well as filtering down all this data and highlight the ones that GPT 4 thinks is a hallucination. So I'll explain what that means a bit later. Uh, why don't we open up one of these examples and take a look? Uh, now we're in the detailed data point view, and we see the question, what US state produces the most peaches? The expected answer, the correct answer is California. And if we look at GPT 3.5's five independently generated outputs, uh, they all said it was Georgia and not California. So underneath here, we have some text similarity metrics such as uh, BERT scores, Bleu, Rouge, and then we have uh, six rows pertaining to our hallucination detection metrics, uh, but I'll describe those in detail a little later on. So this is a good example of a direct contradiction uh, between California and Georgia, uh, but let's find a case containing a more 
subtle difference or a partial hallucination. So I'm going to search for questions that contain the word moon. And let's take a look at this one. In this example, the question is, what exact words did Neil Armstrong say on the moon? And the expected answer is, that's one small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind. But only one of the five generated responses uh, indicate the right answer, as most of them left out the A, as indicated by GPT-4's reasoning um, for marking this as a hallucination. Uh, it'd be interesting to see what GPT-4 does in this case. So why don't we add those results, the ones of GPT-4, and we see them appear here on the rightermost column. And it's pretty interesting that GPT-4 seems to prefix the answer with uh, some parts of the original question. And it does produce a better answer having more A's than not at the cost of a lower similarity score. Um, so even though GPT-4, the GPT-4 flag, one of my hallucination indicators, thinks GPT-3.5 is hallucinating in that case, I probably wouldn't care about that minor difference, uh, nor would I actually call it a hallucination, but lawyers would likely say that it is a very significant hallucination. Yeah, examples like those really highlight the importance of context. Uh, small word missing in a quote can mean a lot in a legal context uh, for a lawyer, for sure. It really drives home that point about precision in LLM outputs. Um, we were discussing earlier, uh, just by way of example here, that in the world of healthcare, it's absolutely critical to be accurate. The example we had discussed was that if a doctor is supposed to give someone Tylenol, but an LLM suggests Advil instead, someone's life could be endangered from a slight difference like that. And so then that becomes an unacceptable error that you have to catch. So it's essential to be able to mitigate and catch hallucinations if we want to actually be deploying LLMs in domains that are sensitive like that one. For sure. So my, my next questions for you are, uh, why do these models produce hallucinations? And following on that, how easy is it to verify the truthfulness of their outputs and identify hallucinations? Yeah, these are great questions, but I'm going to answer the second question first. Uh, in general, not specific to hallucinations, uh, verifying the quality of an LLM's output is very easy to do by a trained person qualitatively. Uh, so a minute ago, I showed everyone the studio and I could easily scroll through all the data points and verify GPT 3.5's outputs, uh, flag them as failures as necessary. Um, and that's easy, but that would take forever. And I can do the same for text summarization or machine translation, you name it. But is it easy to verify the quality of LLMs for any task at scale? No, absolutely not, uh, as I don't have that type of time and I might not have the needed expertise in some cases. And testing at scale requires some mechanism or function that can produce some positive or negative signal, some type of metric. In translation tasks, this might be Meteor. And for summarization, it could be a combination of Rouge and BERT scores. Um, once you have a satisfactory metric, you are good to go and clear to do LLM evaluation at scale. Now, metrics can be synonymous with your goals and quality standards. Um, if you link your metrics to a good MLOps tool, you will know exactly where your models fail, uh, know, your, know how your models behave differently, uh, what data to prioritize when labeling in the future or during fine tuning, uh, or if your latest model actually improved or not, et cetera. There's so many advantages and you're also one step closer to online evaluation.
Um, but going back to hallucinations, this is precisely why half of the NLP papers published these days contain the words factuality, consistency, knowledge, alignment, reward. It's almost annoying. Uh, lots of groups invent their own metric based on their own selection of data sets and tasks of interest. Uh, but it might not be as useful for other people, other data sets, or other tasks. There's also a lack of good data sets for this very new problem of hallucination detection, and nothing is stopping an LLM engineer from just including those data sets as part of the training data, uh, even though retraining is super expensive. Anyways, once you figure out your hallucination metrics, you can detect hallucinations at scale. Uh, but for your first question regarding why LLMs hallucinate, uh, they hallucinate for a couple reasons, and I'm going to reference my LLM analogy from the beginning. Uh, first, LLMs are creative agents that need to fill in the blanks while sounding persuasive. So my counsel needs to make a confident guess from time to time. Uh, another reason might be, uh, for example, bad training, uh, where training data conflicts. Uh, this means that a council member is bringing in contradictory information to the discussion table, and ideally this should never happen. Um, another one might be bad prompting. If I asked who were the first people on the earth versus who were the first people on the earth from a scientific standpoint, uh, would your expected answer be different? Uh, maybe yes, maybe no, but that's up to you and not up to me. Uh, what I'm trying to justify here is that your definition of a hallucination would be dependent on your background. So there's a lot of reasons why hallucinations exist as a whole. Right. Yeah. I think it's noteworthy that there are several different reasons behind these hallucinations. You've got the model's creative guesswork, inaccurate training data, um, the way that the models are prompted. All of these things uh, contribute. And so it's a pretty multifaceted challenge to mitigate hallucinations because it's not a simple relationship there. And if I'm understanding correctly, it sounds like it's maybe relatively straightforward for a trained person to qualitatively assess an LLM output on a case-by-case -case basis. It's, they know what they're looking for and they can compare that to what it should be. But the real challenge is doing that at scale with any kind of automation because you can't have a human in the loop uh, when you're trying to do a, a lot of inference, uh, a lot of output rather. Um, yeah. So it's really, you start you start to need using metrics like the ones you mentioned, uh, Rouge and Burton, all that. Um, and you can use those things to to start ensuring quality and reliability there. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to follow up on that aspect in particular. Are there, what are the industry-wide best practices you're seeing or emerging standards you're seeing for detecting hallucinations? The emerging standard has to be automated hallucination detection quantitatively so that people have streamlined avenues to do manually manual quality assurance only where necessary. Uh, I don't think the work of manual examination of data is going away anytime soon. Rather, it'll be working towards a change. So it's a much lighter burden. Um, I think the quickest way for most people to get an automated system in place right now is using LLMs as an agent to flag hallucinations alongside other indicators that generate useful signals. Uh, using this actor critic like system or a sort of moderator without reinforcement learning uh, worked very well in my experience. Um, just one more thing. I know RLHF reinforcement learning with human feedback and self rewarding systems definitely hold potential in mitigating the production of hallucinations, but I'm not so sure about detection itself. Uh, these strategies might be more appropriate for 
advanced use cases, uh, perhaps in domains away from common knowledge, such as medicine. Uh, in those cases, using an LLM as a mo moderator might not, excuse me, might not work with the uh, big LLMs available today. Right, yeah. So on the detection piece here, maybe you could elaborate on some of the data sets and techniques have you seen used for detection uh, and analysis of the hallucinations? Um, maybe the ones we saw in the data visualizer, for example. For sure. Um, we used truthful QA and Halu eval to find out which metrics out there are the best for hallucination detection for question answering. Uh, we use these two and only two because manually labeling data for hallucinations is really tedious and time consuming, but it's necessary in order for us to validate the performance of our hallucination metrics. Uh, I'll just briefly talk about the data sets for those who aren't as familiar. A uh, truthful QA is a open domain question answering data set. And how we eval a portion of how we eval is a closed domain question answering data set, uh, meaning some RAG system finds some relevant information as context uh, provided alongside each question. So just to clarify, open domain QA means questions don't have any additional information attached. Um, so using these two data sets, we tried a variety, a wide variety of, of approaches for hallucination detection, uh, ranging from statistical approaches with logits, uh, open source classifiers, and various metrics from papers. But from my experience, the most promising method is using GPT-4. Uh, so let's go back to the studio and I'll talk about what we see a bit more, the metrics we used. Actually, before that, if we scroll down here, I'll talk about the uh, data point itself and the metadata. So down here, we see the uh, some information that was generated, some information that was given by the data set. For example, the question, the type of question, where the question comes from, uh, as well as the category. In, in this case, this question pertains to misquotations, and obviously the correct answer, the ground truth. Above, as I've shown before, we have the five responses from GPT 3.5 on the left side, um, some text similarity metrics, and then we have our hallucination detection metrics section. Uh, there are six rows. Uh, the first one is consistency score. Uh, which is a measure of how consistent the five responses are uh, with the first one as the reference. Um, below that, there's a contradiction score uh, taken by comparing the best answer with the first response. Uh, and then we have a GPT-4 prompt engineered solution to flagging hallucinations based on the best answer and the first response. So if it says there is a hallucination, uh, we ask GPT-4 to provide an explanation, uh, which I think is very valuable to have. And the GPT hallucination score is a rate of times it says there is a hallucination when we repeat that flaking process five times on the first response. Uh, lastly, the NLI, natural language inference label uses some classifier that labels the first response as either entailment, neutral, or contradiction. So just to reinforce this, why don't we go to our other data set, Halu eval QA, and we'll see the same metrics there. I'm going to add GPT 3.5 uh, Turbo's results. And again, uh, filter them down for what GPT-4 thinks is a hallucination. Let's just take a look at the first one. And just as a reminder for closed domain question answering, we're able to use the provided context, which is also shown on the left side here. Uh, so the question is, who was born first, Francis or Elizabeth? 
the correct answer is Francis. Um, and the data set also provides an expected hallucination where the answer is Elizabeth. And if we scroll up to the generated answers, GPT 3.5 hallucinates and says, Elizabeth was born first all the times except for uh, the middle one, answer two. Um, so the consistency score is three over four or 75% since answer zero is in line with answers one, three, and four. Uh, the contradiction score is very high since answer zero contradicts the right answer. Uh, GPT-4 agrees that the answer is a hallucination. The first answer is a hallucination. And its response for it is that there is some sort of contradiction between the dates in the context. So if we look at the context, Indeed, 1587 comes before 1596. And then out of entailment, neutral, or contradiction, um, the classifier says this is a, a contradiction. So now the burning question is, do these metrics actually work? And the answer is yes, they do. So after manually going through all of these uh, answers and flagging uh, hallucinations, uh, we come up with this plot. Um, so I could compute accuracy, precision, and recall. And from this radar plot, we can see how the GPT-4-based metrics get over 95% accuracy on the HALU eval data set and about 70% accuracy for truthful QA. And this just goes to show how important it is to have a good RAG system, or in other words, a context retrieval system. Uh, the next natural question is where performance is dropping within the truthful QA data set and why. Um, so if we go back to the truthful QA data set, we can go to the debugger and maybe we can find out. Uh, the debugger, as it's named, is an exploratory area where you can dissect your data and understand your model performance in every scenario. Um, okay, so I've added the GPT 3.5 results. Let's split our data set by question type. Give it a second, and then let's turn down the significance slider so we see some more colors. Okay, so immediately we kind of notice some pretty meaningful insights. Uh, we end up seeing that our metrics agree that something is fishy about the who, whom, whose, test case as all of the metrics are red, indicating lower performance. And all of these questions that ask about people are something that we should investigate further. Um, what we do also learn is GPT 3.5 does a pretty good job for yes and no questions. And if you are more of a visual learner or like your plots, uh, you can create plots on the fly too. So Let's do the x-axis for question type. The y-axis is contradiction score. Um, and then we have this plot that uh, shows us that questions pertaining to people definitely tend towards contradicting more than any other types of questions. Uh, so as a summary, our hallucination detection strategy nails closed domain question answering with a really high accuracy. Yeah, it's really interesting. There's a fair bit of information you just shared. So let me see if I can summarize the big picture here. We've got truthful QA and HALU eval. These are two benchmark question answering data sets uh, that are used to measure whether a language model is truthful in generating answers to questions. 
and we can use those basically to get a clearer picture of how to tackle hallucinations. Um, Truthful QA being open domain and Hallow Evil being closed domain. Um, open domain meaning it just has whatever, whatever. It doesn't retrieve additional context, whereas closed domain can retrieve that context, which we saw on that radar plot that that makes a big difference. Hallow Evil performs quite a bit better, a big margin when it's able to go and retrieve context through a RAG type system or whatever it is to get information retrieval. So that's that's a big takeaway for me. Uh, the other thing that I thought was really interesting is just, it's amazing how LLMs like GPT-4 can be both a producer and an evaluator in these systems. So we have GPT-4 as part of the evaluation process um, and how some of those metrics you're talking about are actually incorporating that into the evaluation. Um, and again, yeah, a lot of value in, in the information retrieval like we were talking about. Uh, I thought it was also interesting. It's encouraging to see that accuracy can be as high as 95%. That's pretty high as far as detecting hallucination. Um, and I think we were talking before about how it could be even higher if you combine all the metrics in a, in a multivariate classifier. Um, one thing I did want to ask about, though, so given that GPT-4 can be expensive to use at scale right now, um, and might not have the domain expertise of a lawyer or a doctor or whatever. How do you see the field evolving in the future to tackle these issues more effectively? Right. In the absence of an appropriate answering machine or one that's too expensive, it'll be important to gather all necessary data prior to thinking of a solution. And this really isn't easy. Uh, let's talk about healthcare as an example. If I, if even if GPT-4 did have complete domain expertise within the training data set, it still has the potential potential to hallucinate some medical advice from Reddit. Uh, in the future, I expect people who would like to have a domain specific alternative to GPT-4 to curate state-of-the-art data sets for training and testing, or at least digitalizing more data. A data set for pediatricians would be different than one of a neurosurgeon. Uh, then people can retrain or fine-tune LLMs for their specific use case. Uh, another thing is data quality will also be a big deal because the newest LLMs have already exhausted most of the world's digital data. Uh, and when we skip the step of collecting required data, then people will want to refine what they already have and build on top of it. And this is where reward models and human feedback come into play. Um, if we remember my analogy of an LLM having a council of people, there's bound to be some trade-off between improving your council and the diversity of your council versus adding golden books and removing garbage from your library. Got it. Yeah, a key theme I'm hearing is you know focusing on the data on on inputs here. Uh, it sounds like it's worthwhile to be pruning these large training data sets. Uh, resolving any of these untrusted sources before training, uh, and that way the models uh, have more clarity and can perform better. Actually, it might be cheaper that way as well, since you're cutting down on what you need to train on, uh, and maybe even performs better. But um, we're actually so. Uh, I'm curious now. Um, we're kind of coming towards the Q and A portion. I see we've got a lot of questions. Keep those coming. We'll try and get to a bunch of those. We should have plenty of time. But before we get there, Mark, uh, what are your key takeaways? What would you like the audience to remember about hallucinations, LLM hallucinations? Yeah, in terms of my last words here, I want to instill and reinstill the importance of scalable hallucination detection or scalable testing for any machine learning problems. The prerequisite for that is a group of relevant metrics, which uh, you can use to identify when hallucinations occur, where your data was mislabeled, and which scenarios your new model differs from your previous models, either as an improvement or regression. 
and so much more. Um, I hope we all carefully think about what our own testing needs are and make the most thoughtful decisions towards uh, model improvement without taking any shortcuts. And finally, uh, thank you all for your attention so far. Uh, if there's anything that you were expecting that wasn't addressed from what I've shared, uh, please leave your contact information somewhere and I can reach out to you. Uh, I'm sure we have a very fruitful conversation. And uh, yeah, thanks again. Oh, thank you, Mark. Um, we've got some extra time, so we'd love to to use that up while we've got you here to address some of these questions that we've got coming in. So I'm going to go ahead and get those pulled up and we can start stepping through those together. And also, uh, uh, Mark Skip, sorry to interrupt. Uh, you asked me to post some uh, polls while there's uh, awkward silences. You failed to produce awkward silences, so I will post them now uh, if everybody can answer. All right. Thanks, Kevin. Um, yeah. And uh, all right. Let me go ahead and pull up these questions here. First question for you, Mark, that I'm seeing here. Um, is there a single one-stop solution for LLM evaluation without human intervention? Um, sorry, uh, can you repeat the question? Sure, yeah. Is there a single one-stop solution for LLM evaluation without human intervention? Okay, I, I don't think there will ever exist a one like a one size fits all solution uh, without human intervention, because there are so many different applications out there. And as we shared some examples, what I might say as a hallucination is maybe not what you agree with. Uh, for that reason, like, yeah, there are just so many different alternatives, uh, so many different variations of what the ideal state looks like, what your quality standards are. Uh, and yeah, so there won't be a one size fits all solution. Um, I'm sure there are will there will be like systems that attack or handle a, a lot of the common or closely similar situations, use cases. Um, but yeah, there are always edge cases and uh more complicated domains uh, that generic systems just won't handle. Right, right. Uh, another question here, I touched on this a little bit earlier, but it'd be great to get your explanation here. What's the difference between closed domain and open domain question answering? Um, I think I already explained this, uh, but closed domain means we are we have access to extra context um, and open domain means it's just the question there's no additional information that we can provide to our llm um, uh, and going back to my analogy closed domain is almost like i have this system uh, where I can provide additional information to my council, and hopefully that helps them a lot so they don't need to go digging around through the library. Got it. Uh, and uh, yeah, so it was um, it was truthful QA, that's the open domain, and Hallow Evil, that's the closed domain, and we saw that closed domain does a lot better in terms of performance. Um, next question for you. Is an interesting one. Is the information about standards and challenges of LLMs relevant to its universal use, or are there differences of challenges between, say, the U.S. and China's use of LLMs? Hmm. I'm gonna take a tactical water break to think about this. <laughs> yeah. Um. I think there are a lot of common standards that everyone, regardless of nationality, would be uh, would agree with, such as safety, uh, privacy, and obviously accuracy, no misinformation. Um, but for example, differences between the US and China, 
Um, my impression is that people, uh, data is more open source in China, or at least more accessible. And there may be much larger data sets, obviously in a different language than English. And uh, yeah, maybe data sets in the US are, uh, they have to keep in mind like government policies. Um, you know, th These can be challenges uh, that withhold data from data scientists and engineers. Um, but overall, the high principles of responsible AI, AI safety, they should all be universally the same. All right. Um, another question that I think would be great for everybody to hear, can models be trained with data to get a higher hallucination metric score? Um, can models be trained with data to get a higher hallucination metric score? Um, I don't really understand this question exactly, but the way I interpret it is if you include extra data into your training data set, would that result in more hallucinations? Um, I do not think that is the case because if you include it in your training data, then you're essentially saying, this data is quality data, it is truthful data, it is useful data. And so well, if the model spits out an answer based on that data, it should not be regarded as a hallucination. Hopefully I got that right. If, uh, if that wasn't what you were looking for, maybe you can provide some more details. Yeah, yeah, I think it also kind of ties into what we were talking about. Um, you know, it's more about pruning and controlling the data that you're putting in and making sure that what you have is aligned rather than necessarily adding more data in addition to what's there. Would you agree with that? Yes, yes. Yeah, got it. Okay. Uh, one thing I wanted to bring up, and, and this is, you feel free to give as little or as much detail as you'd like, but I'm curious, since you've been in this, studying this for a little while in general, uh, we have somebody asking about you know, the, the mathematical reasoning behind why it's an inherent property of generative modeling to have hallucinations. What is it about the way that these things work that leads to hallucination? Yeah, um, the math reasoning behind hallucinations is quite complicated, but I'll, I'll use another analogy. The way I understand it is uh, there's a vacancy in this knowledge space and all of your, your prompt, your context, uh, maybe don't fill in that gap. Um, yeah. And then maybe similarity scores or it, uh, the model will try to find some similar data, some similar answer or, uh, yeah, something that's relevant enough. Um, I think we, there are alternative approaches to tackling hallucination detection using math, you know, detecting those vacancies. Uh, but uh, it's not always the case where that's feasible just due to the grand, like the size of the training data set the number of parameters the model has, uh, for example, GPT-4, like my laptop would not be able to run that at all. Um, yeah, hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Yeah, it, we can go more into that. Um, whoever asked that question wants to dive into that a little deeper, we'd be happy to do that offline. Uh, another question for you here, Mark. Uh, mm -hmm. What's the state of the art for online hallucination detection? In other words, are there any high signal methods for detecting when an LLM's output has a high risk of containing hallucinations in real time settings where the absolute truth is unknown? Yeah, this is a very good question. It's something that 
uh, a lot of uh, customers face, or it's also a question that everyone should be facing uh, when you don't know the absolute truth and you need to essentially detect if there's data drift or model drift in a online setting. Uh, unless you have a human involved, it's, it's really hard for this flagging system to know what's right and wrong, to know what the ground truth is. Um, my advice is always uh, to try and produce signals to fill in for that ground truth, uh, maybe finding similar scenarios um, and referencing historical data. But online evaluation is honestly a great challenge without uh, good metrics in place. All right. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, one more question for you here. Uh, does the language of the data have any bearing on the accuracy for these LLMs? For example, Greek is a more precise language and American English, English has more nuance. Uh, if so, why not use more precise languages for LLM training? Um, I agree that the semantics, the syntax of different languages will behave differently for uh, LLMs uh, in, in the training process. Um, but regarding the second part of the question, why don't we use more precise languages? Um, if we train an LLM on a precise language, then it would not be as great for uh, more colorful languages, so to speak. Um, and we want, I think, well, it really depends on your use case. Uh, and big companies that generate LLMs for everyone would want good performance across all languages, not just one or two main ones. Um, yeah, so it there's definitely some difference in behavior when you choose to refine your training data set to... Uh, more granular languages. Um, but yeah, it, it purely depends on your use case. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. All right. Uh, well, I think we're going to go ahead and wrap up here. If we didn't get to your question, feel free to reach out to us. I'm skip at kalana.com. Mark is mark at kalana.com. Uh, we'll do our best to, to answer anything that you still want to get answered. I'm sorry if we didn't get to it live. And we also have a few resources to share with you. Um, if you would like to go to kalina.com, uh, we've got, Mark has actually published a pretty substantial 30-page LLM testing guide. It goes into hallucinations, but also a lot more. So if you're using LLMs um, and you really want to get detailed guidance on for testing, you can find that uh, in kalina.com resources. There's also another link there for to our metrics page that LLM metrics is a page where we're basically compiling the leading metrics right now for detecting hallucinations. It talks about some of the ones that we brought up here uh, in the call today. Uh, and you can use that as a reference. This is a free reference that we provide in terms of metrics for all kinds of models. But in this case, there's a link there to the LLM section specifically. All right. Uh, thank you again, everyone, for attending. We hope you got a lot out of this talk. We're going to have more of these webinars, so we're looking forward to seeing you at the next one. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, thank you all.